All right, welcome everyone. We're having a little bit of a delayed start, but we're going to go ahead and move forward with our program today. I appreciate all of you being here and being part of the program with us. Um, my name is Tony Anson. I'm the president of Global Minnesota, and I'm pleased to welcome you to Strategic Alliances, Belarus, and Europe with the Massive Masonic. Um, I'm going to thank our program partner today, the corporate member of Eastview Information Services. So a huge thanks to, uh, to Eastview. And so it's great to have their support for the program that we're doing together today. For those of you that are not familiar with Global Minnesota, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit, member based organization. We're dedicated to advancing international engagement and understanding. Um, we're a pretty busy organization. We have about uh, 50 professional exchange delegations annually with participants from over 130 countries each year that we support. We host 75 events like this, our World Affairs events featuring visiting diplomats and ambassadors and foreign policy experts. We deliver international programs, virtual exchanges, and knowledge competitions for high school and college students all across Minnesota. And for our business community, we provide programs on sustainability topics, on international trade, local trends and challenges, and foreign policy. In all, just over the past year, 450 different activities inspired about 15,000 people to participate with us to learn about our changing world. Importantly, I want to thank uh, the many individuals in the room with us tonight and, uh, and invite those who are, um, are not. I really, really want to take a moment. How many, how many members do we have in here? Kind of raise your hands. So huge thanks to all of our members. Um, keep your hands up for one second for the non members of the room. Find one of these people and ask them why it's great to be a Global Minnesota member on the chat to share that with you, I think. Um, when you become a Global Minnesota member, you become part of a community that shares your interest in engaging in encouraging dialogue creating connections and understanding how global affairs and foreign policy affect our nation and affect our world. For over seven decades, we've provided our members a nonpartisan gathering place where they can connect with influential global leaders, get exposure to different cultures and viewpoints, and gain firsthand insights into critical international topics. Global Minnesota shares the best of Minnesota with the world and the world of Minnesota. And you too can become a member and help to power this mission to learn more, you can visit our website or see one of our team members at the table outside. They'd be happy to share more with you about that mission. I also want to take a moment to thank our many corporate members uh, that helped to support and fuel our mission as well. And you can see them on the screen behind me here. Um, their dedication to international understanding helps us to do the many things that we do as well. So now on to our program for the evening. Our topic today is a timely and important one in understanding the contours of the complicated relationship among Belarus, Russia, and dozens of other countries throughout Europe. Belarus has a uniquely close relationship with Russia over the years, and even played a role in supporting Russian troops in the invasion of Ukraine. President Lukashenko has served as president since 1994, making him the longest serving president in Europe. He was recently re-elected in a controversial and highly um, disputed election in 2020. We are fortunate today to have a guest who has first-hand experience with the Belarusian politics, and a very impressive individual indeed, uh, Ambassador of the um, um, Senate. Thank you, Ambassador, for being with us today. He is a prominent opposition leader living in exile and was recently featured in the documentary This Kind of Hope, which was screened last evening at the Dramatic uh, American Institute. I understand people thought it to be very moving and very, very interesting program. Um, I'm grateful now in a moment to turn it over to uh, Dima uh, from Lilith. Uh, he's the CEO, uh, he is with Eastview Information Services to introduce the ambassador, uh, Kent Lee, the president of Eastview, and Nemo uh, are part of a team at Eastview that makes this program possible for all of us. I do want to take a moment to note that there are books available uh, that you can actually purchase. You actually have like, purchase, you can make a donation to receive one of the books. I think the ambassadors wanted to sign the books tonight as well. Um, the the, the uh, proceeds from the books actually go to help political prisoners in Belarus. So that's uh, a very worthy thing that they're trying to do. It's a terrific book. So if you get a chance, um, please do so. I'd now like to turn it over to Dima to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Uh, Dima Drainmo, uh, uh, Vice President of Eastview, and my, my uh, partner, Ken Lee, is stuck in traffic. And uh, fortunately, he will be here maybe in 20 minutes. So he, he asked me to, uh, to read uh, his introduction. But I thought I would be reading somebody else's introduction. But maybe I'll just tell you a story about uh, how I met Andre. That would be more interesting than the world of the person. Uh, Andre and I know each other from 
So yeah, I, I come from Belarus and um, I remember once I was sitting maybe in the bar for working day design negotiations with the with the with the British gentleman and well, he was not part of the international crowd the foreign services, he was simply man, he was asking me. Belarus, I don't, I don't know the country, but where is it? I said, it's, it's between Russia and Poland. He was pausing a little bit, probably remembering some geography, some history, said, it's not a place for the country to be situated. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it is uh, extremely important. I had the privilege to know uh, great American 
of Polish origin, Zbigniew Brzezinski. And uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski concept was that Ukraine is a cornerstone of security, that if Ukraine is independent and free, Russia will cease to exist as an empire. It will stop its imperialistic uh, past and will be going towards democracy. And I was arguing with him because, okay, okay, I agree. I agree that uh, Ukraine is, is cornerstone, but you forget about Belarus because Belarus is a linchpin. A lot of processes, a lot of uh, both negative and positive were happening in Belarus, which affected the whole region of Europe and the Soviet Union as well. So I, I would like to speak about the importance of Belarus, and since uh, the organizers wanted me to speak about special relations with Russia, we will do this. And I call this my presentation from this belief to custom, because I discovered that uh, probably these names that do not tell you anything. But it is very significant names for the historic history in our region. Because Viskuli is uh, a place where the Soviet Union was denounced in December uh, 1991. And Hastomel is the place which was attacked in the first days of massive invasion of Russia on Ukraine in February 2022. It is, it is where the airport uh, is sitting. So I wanted, to, by, by this uh, title, I wanted to uh, stress that uh, in a very short historic period, we came from something positive to something very negative. And the positive for us was uh, this kind of uh, event which happened in Belarus, in uh, the forest of Belareja, in the place physically, which was the hunting lodge, which was used by the bosses of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And it was uh, done on the 8th of uh, December 1991, when uh, Shushkevich invited Yeltsin, Shushkevich, the head of state of Belarus, invited Yeltsin, president time president of Russia and virtual president of Ukraine, uh, for a meeting. They all have different, can different goals. Shushkevich said to me first, and then he said it publicly, that his goal was to make sure that Russia provides uh, enough gas to Belarus, because it was cold winter, Difficult time was coming. Kravchuk wanted to get free of the Soviet Union, and Yeltsin wanted to become a Tsar of Russia. So, and uh, but they managed to create the most meaningful moment in history of the 20th century, uh, signing the denunciation of the Soviet Union, the treaty that was. So in 1922, they, in this police, it was denounced. And uh, after that, it was quite a positive period of development that Belarus, because Belarus, uh, and I will be stressing it regularly, is a unique country. Even out of all former Soviet republics, it has a unique history because all. So I am not including, of course, Baltic states, because Baltic states are different. So but all other 12 former Soviet republics, they immediately had their presidents. All the party secretaries became presidents, and they were thinking of themselves uh, uh, as presidents, but being actually being still party secretaries and not a communist. Belarus was a parliamentary party. It was... Uh, uh, Shushkevich was the head of parliament, and he was head of state. And we managed to survive as a parliamentary republic for three years, for three plus years. And it was really helpful for, for us to achieve some, to achieve some progress towards democracy. But unfortunately, then uh, we had the 
ambitions of our uh, then Prime Minister Vyacheslav Kevich, who you see here, embracing Prime Minister of Russia, Viktor Chernomerdia, who wanted, all of a sudden, who wanted to become a president. And that is why he was lobbying the Constitution, changes in the Constitution that he will introduce the post of president. He thought that since he's Prime Minister, it's inevitable when <laughs> he will be elected as president according to the new constitution. And it was Cambridge who first introduced the notion of the union state. He, he was trying to run since he ruined everything in the economy. There was a stagnation done, so he he was trying to run on the on the slogan that we will unite with Russia and his <laughs> special thing was uh, he thought that it would be attractive. He said that and we will change one Belarusian ruble to one Russian ruble. And Belarusian ruble at that time was maybe five times uh, uh, weaker than, than Russian ruble. So uh, they managed to introduce these changes in the Constitution. The Constitution was adopted in uh, on the 15th of March 1994, and, and then uh, they announced the presidential election. And that is the candidate that was a wild cat, of course, uh, but uh, he was entrusted by Kevich, this ambitious, our ambitious prime minister, to get rid of Shushkevich. And he produced the corruption report that Shushkevich allegedly stole the books of mails. And that was enough to remove Shushkevich from the position of speaker of the, of the parliament and open the way to this guy who was an extremely popular. He was a populist and uh, he was not uh, even knowing what uh, to do with the economy, but uh, he, he was offering simple solutions to the people as, as the population. So from that time, the, our history started to change because uh, he, when he became president, and please note that he is taking the oath of allegiance with the proper Belarusian flag, which is white, red, and white. Today, uh, he is arresting people for this flag. He is giving them sentences. A person exposing this flag could receive up to 10 years in prison just for showing the flag public. Uh, it was uh, adopted by the parliament as well as our coat of arms, but then uh, Lukashenko changed the symbols, making them quasi Soviet symbols and uh, now he he he's trying to claim that, that these are the state symbols of, of Belarus, but Belarusians know that our real symbols are Belarus. And uh, then uh, he was elected as a president in the only democratically, more or less democratic democratic election in, in, in Belarus. After that, we never had any election. So I wouldn't call him a president. And I wouldn't call uh, what he's uh, presenting as a, as, a, as a first uh, to be an election. And then, uh, uh, then our special relations still said with Russia started because Yeltsin was badly ill. He was on the verge of maybe dying because of his heart problems in 1996. And uh, Zuganov, uh, the communist leader, leader of the Communist Party of Russia, was gaining momentum and gaining a lot of support and the uh, votes. And uh, Yeltsin's PR team uh, uh, didn't find anything better than to go into the famous uh, Russian game of gathering lands. And one of the land, first land they wanted to get was Belarus. So they asked uh, Lukashenko to play. Uh, to, to support Yeltsin in this uh, um, election campaign, presidential campaign in Russia, and Lukashenko eagerly agreed, but he already knew what he will get for this. What he got for this, that he got complete support of Yeltsin, who was re-elected, to his unlawful referendum of November 1996, when he usurped the power, when he destroyed the separation of powers. <laughs> And uh, after that, uh, 
when Putin came to power, I, I want to stress that it was not Putin who insisted on Union State. It was Yeltsin. And they signed, before Putin signed some agreement, they signed three agreements. Lukashenko and Yeltsin, first with the some kind of society of uh, Belarus and, and Russia, then Union, then they signed the uh, uh, Charter and other basic documents for the Union State. So Putin is just the successor of the policy that was started by Yeltsin, who is considered to be a Democrat, maybe, but not for us, because he was really not very supportive of any democratic changes and processes in Belarus, and he was very supportive of uh, Lukashenko. And then that's that's how our election is going now. So uh, I think that they, they give orders not only to soldiers, not only to the people, they give orders first of all to the election committees to to ensure that there is a hundred percent vote for the fourth election. And uh, what happened after that, and why I called the I, I chose the title uh, from this colleague, which uh, actually freed us and uh, we regained our independence and freedom to Hastomo, which is the horrible episode of the war that Russia unleashed on Ukraine, because it was prepared, the war was prepared on the territory of Belarus. And the whole world was observing. The whole world was watching. It started with the military drills up at or West 2009. Medvedev uh, was the place called the for, for Putin. And uh, the scenario that was leaked to the press, and then it was confirmed that it was a real scenario of this dream, was nuclear strike on Warsaw. And break through through the Suvalki gap towards Kaliningrad to cut off Baltic states from the rest of Europe. In 2009, these, these were the plans of Russia, these were the plans of Kremlin. Then it, it, it continued to repeat itself uh, up until 2021, when uh, uh, it was so clear that Russia is getting ready to war. We had about 250,000 Russian troops on the territory of Belarus at that time, on the border with Ukraine. So it was so obvious that Russia will attack. It was so obvious that Lukashenko is in the goal. It was so obvious that the goal will be Kiev, because then the shortest way from, from the territory of uh, uh, Putin, Salai, Lukashenko to Belarus, uh, to, to, towards the capital of um, uh, Ukraine. So you see, and these are the not even not all of the units, Russian units that were gathered on the borders of, of Ukraine on the territory of Belarus. Uh, and and uh, my my view is not not my view. I think that uh, Belarus. Why I say that Belarus is a rich people because if Belarus was supported in 2020 when we started our revolution, when the whole country uh, rejected Lukashenko, when the whole country was revolting, when the whole country was demonstrating and protesting in the streets. And we didn't have any support. We didn't have any, any understanding what to do. If we were supported at that time, if we were, if Lukashenko was sanctioned, severely sanctioned at that time, there will be no war in Ukraine. I'm sure about that because look at this. We call it Belarusian Balkan. Uh, we need to straighten the line of Europe, which means straighten the line of democracy, which means straighten the line of freedom, the line of freedom. And then there will be no danger in this region because uh, uh, it is obvious that. Uh, Putin still has the goal we just discussed uh, going here with Dima and Olga uh, about his real intentions and plan. And I, I, I think that he is still having Kiev as his goal. And he is still uh, 
uh, counting on, on the territory of Belarus to serve as a springboard to amass a new attack in Kyiv. So I think uh, that uh, for the security of the region, for the security of Europe, and for international security, Belarus is extremely important. And that is why I, I recently published a set of articles for, from my friends from different countries, neighboring our neighboring countries, and others called, which is called Belarus in London, which you saw in the, in the beginning of, of uh, uh, our meeting, uh, which claims and, and actually uh, the top notch military and foreign experts confirmed that without Belarus, there would be no secret. That Europe needs Belarus as badly as Belarus needs Europe and me. So that is why I am, my message is, since my message was mentioned, what the message will be, that uh, stop ignoring the horrible situation in Belarus because it is horrendous and it is uh, not, uh, the, the, there is no proper attention because we have about 10,000 political prisoners today. In, in Europe, it is, it, I never thought that they would even, be able to pronounce such a figure uh, connected with Belarus. But that is the case today. And people are not kept in prison. People are being killed in prison. Just yesterday, we learned about another killing of a person who was in prison waiting for trial. It is a sixth person of whom we know since 2021 that was killed in prison. And, and still, the, 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 the free world is discussing whether introduce sanctions or not, whether uh, enter the interdial with the Kashenko. No. Cor another horrible figure is the report is contained in the report of the Freedom House about the state of democracy in the world. For the 18th consecutive year, democracy is diminishing in the world. For the 18th consecutive year, the number of auto autocratic regimes is growing, and the number of uh, democratic improvements is going down, dramatically going down. So without uh, making conclusions, and without taking very resolute measures to deal with these dictators, uh, I think that will face more and more security threats. So. Thank you. I'll stop here because I want to hear your questions. So I'm being done. So thank you. If you have a question for the ambassador, you can just raise your hand. Thank you. Yes. How is Europe responding to this? What's the relationship? With Europe. Uh, the Europe consists of uh, 28 countries and uh, that are members of the European Union, 10 more that are not members of the European Union. Different. They, uh, if you take Portugal, for example, you don't care. <laughs> I don't know that they uh, ever mentioned those in their foreign policy statements. If you take uh, Warsaw, Poland, Vilnius, Lithuania, they took care, especially when after Lukashenko, after Lukashenko started this uh, migration offensive, mi migrants offensive uh, against them, weaponized migration. I, I think it, it is an operation which is definitely a joint operation of Putin and Lukashenko, bringing migrants and uh, throwing them to Poland and the Lithuania, first of all. Little, little longer. So, they have they've been too complacent for a very long time. You know, dictatorship is very lucrative. Dictatorship allows you to get very quick and big money without complying with any rules. And that was very attractive for the West. It was very attractive for our neighbors. And even today, I mentioned these two countries because they are genuine and really interested in, in Belarus and trying to support us. And they are known, the trade and Poland, as the strongest critics of Lukashenko's decision. At the same time, 
they have the highest trade to know with with the regime of the Kashmir. So it is it is not about Europe. It is not about uh, you know different attitude towards Lukashenko, towards Belarusian Democrats. It is about the necessity to prevent dictators finally from coming to power. Because I am now a member of the newly organized World Liberty Congress. I am one of the members of the leadership Congress. We have um, 30 dissidents from 53 countries. Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, uh, China, like Uyghur, Xinjiang, and uh, Tibet. And, uh, you know, we, we compare the practices, and they are similar. We compare the behavior of the freedom, which is, uh, look, Xi Jinping is coming to the visit to France, and uh, the foreign minister of France, who was, uh, who was supportive of uh, the revolution of Iranian women uh, against hijab, uh, the monster hijab wearing, I met with, with the Mullah's regime. So it is it is hypocrisy and it is some some I, I don't know even how to how to define it. Uh, and uh, we, we're trying to now in this World Liberty Congress, we're trying to nail the patterns which can be and should be attacked and destroyed with the help of free will. Because free free will, because we we are on the verge of depleting our domestic resources. And it is clear for me, for example, from my friends from Iran, from my friends from Venezuela, from Cuba, that without the help, meaningful help of the great people, well, we will not succeed in years. Yes. So, um, can you question about the region, the like some other In Russia, most of the people in the residential replacements are cooking by the first time meals. You know, in Belarus, is there the potential of overthrowing the system which has been established, which basically is creating the, the limitation of freedom? Is there a chance for another? I think yes, because it is different, absolutely different regimes. Although uh, Putin was the disciple of Lukashenko, Putin was following Lukashenko, uh, his practice of repression, dealing with civil society, dealing with independent press, dealing with opposition leaders. And they were fully, uh, we discussed it with my good friend, unfortunately killed by Kremlin, by Putin, uh, by his name, so. And, uh, it was absolutely clear for both of us that uh, Putin was not only watching, he knew the technologies that were used by Lukashenko to, uh, to unleash violence against us. So I think that, uh, uh, but at the same time, The regime of Lukashenko is centered against one person. And one person only takes a decision, any decision. And why I say that I, I would like to think that it will collapse? Because, because uh, it is actually the history teaches us if we have such a regime that it will collapse. There will be no success because uh, Lukashenko thinks of himself as immortal and eternal. He never th even thought, he never even allowed himself to think about any success. In Russia, it is different. First of all, it's a big mess. <laughs> and it's a big problem for many years, maybe for hundreds of years. Second, it's, it's, they have different groups of influence and different power centers. Military, special services, oligarchs, industry, and they all are involved in this power game. I can agree with you that in Russia it could be worse because they will be defending their assets, all these groups. In Belarus, I think the people are so tired. Uh, 
and uh, when I told you about political prisoners, we have arrests and tensions going and trials going on on a daily basis. On a daily basis, of course. <clears throat> situation is very depressing. It's horrendous situation. It's people are living without much hope. But at the same time, it shows that he is not controlling because he needs victims every day to show that he is in control. It is not uh, the real governing of the country. It is just using violence to control the power structures in Belarus to control people. That's it. And I think that the hatred is growing. And more, more, moreover, since I said that there is a regular on a daily basis arrest, it is already affects his own people. Because all the, they have families and family members are being arrested, family members, their rights being abused. And so I, I think that, that, that that's why I, I'm a little centric, you know. I think that we have much better chance to get rid of this regime and to proceed with reforms very quickly. So, uh, my scenario, I really enjoy seeing the movie this kind of hope. And first of all, just a quick suggestion I strongly urge the folks that work with you here in Minnesota to try to get your film into the Twin Cities International Film Festival. Uh, the New York State Film Festival. And one thing that I did brought me strongly in the movie was, was grotesque and amusing at the same time, was um, telling that Lukashenko cried the day he gave up Belarus's nuclear weaponry. Presumably those went all entirely in the hands of the Russians. The Ukraine, so far as I know, is the only country in the world it voluntarily gave up its nuclear weapons, and it was forced a guarantee, some guarantees on its sovereignty. So here's the question for the world. If Putin conquers the Ukraine, what would be the next country to voluntarily give up their possession of nuclear weapons? What's the hope for the world disarmament? First, thank you. Uh, first, uh, Belarus was the first country to give up nuclear weapons from the terror. Together with South Africa, I even produced the press release international that was widely distributed in the United Nations. The two countries who voluntarily first in the world announced nuclear weapons and made a statement that they will become uh, non-nuclear members of NPT This all the you know discussion about whether Ukraine if they didn't renounce the weapons, if they didn't give up or I was negotiating all this. It was not possible to retain control for many reasons. It was not possible to even to uh, even to negotiate differently because for, for many reasons I, I'll give you what technical the the nuclear weapons are very is a very sensitive stuff they need maintenance and they need maintenance regularly and when when we were negotiating the success, succession issues. The maintenance time was running up, especially on the Ukrainian uh, ICBMs that were situated in, 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 in Ukraine, both and on the arms. So, yes, I could theoretically, we could have um, tried to uh, regain some control. First of all, uh, uh, we didn't try because we had only um, mobile. ICBMs, ICBMs is the Canadian ballistic missiles with nuclear weapons on our territory. Ukrainians had silence, uh, they, they had more, much more headache than we because they had this uh, very toxic fuel, missile fuel. Uh, and uh, 
They, I, I know my friends, uh, partners in the, during this negotiation, that they tried to break the code. It's a secret, so don't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> they tried to break the code. They were really trying because the codes were with Kremlin, with Moscow. It, it was all controlled from Kremlin, so it was not. You had you had dangerous weapon which you cannot control and you won't be able to make. So the only way was to try to negotiate with the United States for compensation or withdrawal of the government for compensation for nuclear stuff that was contained in the uranium, highly enriched uranium that was contained in the nuclear. That's it. So, and we were more, much more interested in good relations with the Western world, first of all, with the United States and this disarmament negotiations and how, how we solve these succession issues allowed us to get support and to be regarded as a reliable partner. And that was all done during the period when we were parliamentary. <laughs> so we, we managed to use this time effectively, but then we shut it down. Again, my answer is sanctions, because sanctions help to free Eastern Europe. Sanctions that were introduced against this Germany, against Poland, especially after the military situation, military state in Poland, against Romania, against other Eastern European countries. Uh, the, the mistake is to think that sanctions do not work because we didn't have real sanctions on the yeah. Yeah. Because for the first time, the same economic sanctions, I don't, uh, I always have to explain, sanctions against people, against officials, officials, as they are called, targeted sanctions, do not work at the moment. Because it is, it is not, uh, the Russians who have their money, who have their kids, who go to, to, on vacation to, to, to Europe, it's Russian. So against Russians, it's a thing. Against the KGB person, Lukashenko doesn't allow them to go anywhere. So it's, it's simply not effective. Uh, for the first time, they started to introduce sanctions was March 2012, when I was in prison. And I was released, and my life probably was saved. I was released together with my, with my friend, we did the main to manage my campaign. And then they made a stupid uh, thing because uh, they did, uh, did announce that there will be sanctions against three um, bank men of uh, Lukashenko and their companies, which will be followed uh, uh, with sanctions against two more. As my, my friend from England told them, in Russia there are oligarchs, in Russia there are minigarchs. <laughs> so two more minigarchs were to be sanctioned. When we were released, there's no sanctions. And my friend Nikolai Stavkevich and my colleague had to serve the full term of his sentence, five years. 
He's again in prison, in very difficult conditions. And uh, so, uh, what happened after that? European Union put forward three conditions, not much, three. After which, if they are complied with, if they are accepted by Lukashenko, then the sanctions will be lifted. None of them was accepted. Sanctions were lifted. And then the parade of foreign leaders started, including State Secretary of the United States, including some presidents. Lukashenko was invited to official visit to Austria. Australian president and German president came to Belarus. That's what he needed. That's what he needed. He needed to have another proof that the West is weak. The West will never introduce sanctions. The West could be corrupt, right? And the attention span is very short. And that's it. That is why when I hear that sanctions do not work, we didn't have sanctions. And even, even when the, 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 there are attempts, uh, the West got is uh, very quickly is getting scared of its own attempts and leave the sanctions. So uh, I, I think that really the situation in the world is horrible. It, it is now clear, I don't know, that was our message from Belarus that there is no such things as human rights and democracy per se. It is the, these things are connected with the hard security. If you allow mass abuse of human rights, if you allow destruction of democratic institutions, wait for the war in Europe, like, like where we're heading today against Ukraine, and it is not there. So it is not like, uh, okay, just a couple of people in prison and the people in rating. No, no, no. It is the madman who is like Dr. Strangelove is planning the revenge. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Russian government in? I don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't care because, you know, it is also. The question that I, I don't like to answer because it is not the right question. Because nobody asked for solidarity. What are you doing? Look, there, there is a, a, a military, mighty military machine to, to, to the east of your country. And then they will, but they will intervene immediately. What are you doing? Nobody. Everybody was supporting Poland, including the Pope, including all the leaders of the free world. That's what we expect, and that's what we need. Yes, please. It was predictable when he stopped his uh, <laughs> march on Moscow. He said immediately that he would be killed. I think, I think we will also. The, we have to be ready to find out that probably Lukashenko was also in Congress in this whole operation. And that is why Prigozhin was uh, accepted on the territory of Belarus and he was trying to hide there. But <laughs> Lukashenko uh, sells anybody if he can get some proof. So he was selling Putin to Prigozhin, he was selling Prigozhin to Putin. So I think that uh, was inevitable. And uh, what was also inevitable, many analysts didn't believe it. Uh, they thought that, okay, there is a Wagner group now. And they will probably uh, be preparing another attack on Ukraine. So that's all many. It simply shows that the people do not understand Lukashenko in the position. Lukashenko is greedy. Lukashenko will never pay anybody any money. And he will never allow any uh, group that could present danger on the territory of Belarus. And that's why we have now Wagner running away from Belarus because they're not paid any money. And they're running away to, towards Africa. So it's now, again, the, the problem for how to deal with it because this private uh, 
companies are ruthless because they they they're criminals, so they have to be. Yeah. I think that the, all the well, sanctions are announced, <clears throat> but as with, with the announcement of more sanctions, more loopholes, loopholes emerge. So they have to be good. One thing. Second thing, what worries me a lot is that today's sanctions against Belarus are tied towards <laughs> sanctions against Russia, which is connected with the war in Ukraine. Forgetting about the original intention of the West to sanction Lukashenko regime because of the crime against humanity, because of so many abuse, because of so many political prisons, because of killing of innocent people during the peaceful demonstrations. And then somehow not the argument anymore. They are parallel parallel in the sanctions together with Russia, which is not the right thing to do. Lukashenko is a serial criminal. He's guilty of crimes against humanity. He is guilty of uh, war crimes, including kidnapping Ukrainian kids from, from the Ukrainian territory together with the Russians. Any, any sanctions. And uh, I always say it is morally justified because the condition for sanctions should be not Lukashenko step, step down, but release all political prisoners. If you release all political prisoners, I would be the first one to say that lift all the sanctions. We have to save people's lives. Okay, are we running out of time? Not only me, but my friends, my family. Yeah, it is difficult for me to live uh, anywhere. I love America, I love Poland, many countries. <laughs> to go there. And that's why I think, uh, I think, um, I say it in the film that uh, I, I regard my exile as a post. I, I'm a diplomat. I just have a post in which is <laughs> becomes a little bit longer than I expected. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil. Mention again that the, the books are over here. I think we have a, a way you can make a contribution in the room tonight if you'd like to get our books. And also, I think it can be done for Cape Town online too. Is that right? So please, please look at that. Um, again, a huge thanks to the ambassador for taking time with us tonight uh, and giving voice really to the political prisoners, the people of Belarus that have been, they really have no voice for themselves right now. And you're here to be able to, to share with us and give a better understanding of um, the challenges that country is facing, the challenges that people are facing. And hopefully, uh, uh, maybe some ideas about a pathway to a different future, which um, is very, very helpful to all of us today. Um, I want to say thanks again to uh, Eastview um, uh, Information Services for helping put this together. I know Kent was able to join us. Kent, did you want to say a word or two as the president of Eastview? For, I know you've, you've been hosting uh, the ambassador here. I don't want to put you on the spot, Kent, but if you'd like to say a word or two, I know you had... And you, you, uh, you did the you did, you did the hard job of fighting the traffic to get here today. <laughs> if you wanted to say a word or two, real yeah. quickly, you're sure welcome to do that. Yeah, and do something about overturn semis on two days. Yeah, there was a yes. <laughs> no, no, no. So I, um, let's see. Um, that, that's an impossible act to follow. So, so um, no. Um, um, if if nothing was said about Eastfield, then. Just to know that we're we're um, we're a company from uh, uh, headquartered here for 35 years, uh, and uh, you know for the last uh, this last period we've done our best to bring peoples of the east and west together. Usually, it takes the form of bringing exceptionally diverse collections of information publications, uh, books and journals and newspapers and maps to to institutions. Um, uh, first of all, research institutions. 
uh, the, the leading uh, centers where PhDs and master's theses are, are, are put together. Um, but sometimes we get involved in bringing uh, to our home turf uh, some of the people who play a major role in these societies, and hence um, Ambassador Sack of, of with us here, um, uh, and, and, and the Association of Global um, uh, Minnesota is, is, is a wonderful resource. So, so that's that's all I, 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 would, I would say. It, it was. Uh, 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 I, ho I hope that we can continue to uh, to support global Minnesota, and and uh, and um, uh, after 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 this kind of kick off meetings here in Minnesota, Ambassador Sonikov and Dima are going to be going around uh, to the United uh, two different places, uh, Stanford University and uh, several places in Washington. And uh, as you all know now, uh, the ambassador has has so much to say, and uh, and, uh, and so thanks thanks for for being just here. So. And our governor every year gives out a small number of uh, trade awards, international trade awards, and uh, Eastfield was one of the winners this year of the Governor's International Trade Awards. So congratulations to you for um, for your uh, for your award and for your recognition this year for the good work that you're doing across the world. Um, I want to say a couple of words about upcoming events for those of you that like to maybe come to your next global Minnesota event. Um, we were, I was going to invite you to come to join us at Fiona Hill for navigating the world in turmoil, um, but she, and I'm not going to say unfortunately, but she, she has completely sold out, um, so it's been a very popular program. We may be able to open a few more slots, so yeah, keep an eye on our website, but we're really excited to have a Fiona Hill with us next week. We also are hoping to support a special a film screening of the documentary COPA 71 at the uh, MSP International Film Festival, which is actually starting this week. Um, features the story of a legendary soccer uh, match amongst uh, the greatest female soccer players in the world that took place in Mexico City long before there was a World's uh, Women's World Cup. If you'd like to see that, we welcome to join us. We also have a program coming up on April 25th called Doing Business in Times of Shifting Global Alliances. Uh, this is presented in partnership with the Minnesota Bar Association's International Business Law Section. We're talking about trends, regulations, and emerging challenges happening in international business across the world. And then for those that like a gala, we have, and anybody heard that we have a gala coming up? The members have heard this over and over from us, I'm sure. We're very excited to have our Come Sail Away gala going on, coming up on May 18th. We'll we'll be celebrating five port cities around the world, food and entertainment from those port cities, um, and, and a really wonderful evening of coming together to help support the work of global Minnesota. So thanks again to everybody for being here. Huge thanks for joining us and helping to do the work that we're trying to do together here, which is to advance international understanding and engagement across Minnesota and frankly across the world. So thanks for being here tonight.